there we go. So in this workshop, we're only going to cover some of what can be done with the process macro in SPSS. And in particular, we're just going to focus on mediation models, and we are not going to cover anything to do with moderation in any way. Now, process can handle moderation models, moderation meaning interactions, and of course, moderated mediation, which is what most people want to do when they come to use this macro. But that's a super huge topic and more than I could cover in one workshop. So the focus here is just going to introduce the mediation models here. We're using version four of the process macro. So there are numerous versions. You want to uh, make sure you're using version four, which is the current one. And most of the material for this workshop is based on Andrew Hayes's book, Introduction to Mediation, Moderation, and Conditional Process Analysis. This is a regression-based approach, third edition. So there are three editions of the book and four versions of the macro. Uh, the new version, this version three, edition three of the book came out earlier this year. Uh, I bought my copy off of Amazon and it was about 75 bucks. The trick is that the documentation for the process macro is almost solely contained within the book. And Hayes does this on purpose because he wants you to buy the book. And so if you're looking around for um, documentation for the macro, you're not going to find a whole lot online uh, simply because that's the way Hayes wants it. He wants you to, to buy and read his book. Um, I did look around online quite a bit as I was doing the research for this workshop, and I find a lot of stuff that is somewhat out of date. He has certainly made improvements and changes to the various uh, versions of the macro. And when you're looking online, I have found that most people don't indicate what version of the macro they're talking about. And so some of what you find online is still uh, valid and still works and some of it not so much. So uh, when you're looking around, just try to be careful, uh, please, uh, so that you're getting the correct information. So this is the web page we're going to be uh, working from. If you haven't gotten to here, this is our home page, and you can click here on resources and then oops, resources and seminars. And when you click on this, um, well, it's currently listed here because we're uh, doing it this quarter, but in general, you would come down uh, here to the SPSS and click here, and then you would be on this here page. Now, let's talk about uh, the macro and its installation. In the message I sent out yesterday, I invited people to go ahead and go through this process before coming to this workshop um, in case you would like to follow along. And I, you know, I encourage everybody to follow along if you would like to, uh, but that is totally up to you. To get the um, macro, you go to uh, processmacro.org. And this is that web page here. And then you can click on uh, download. Oh, I guess I already clicked on that. Here's the home page. This is uh, the process home page. He now has it for R that's uh, new. Uh, having it for R, he's had it for SAS and SPSS for a while, but he just added it for R. Uh, here's all sorts of good information stuff like that but what you want to do is come here to download and you get your copyright information all the rest of this and if you come down here and click on this you will download the current version of the macro um, i don't believe you can download earlier vi versions this will download a zip um, a zipped file for you when you've done that and you unzip the file, this is what you're going to see. This is the contents of the unzipped file. Now, everybody looks at, because if you know anything about the process macro, you know that it's all based on these model numbers and everybody is excited about this and wants to um, find the model numbers. And this is all that's in that page. And it tells you to go to Appendix A of the book. So anyhow, um, the, the model numbers are not in that um, little text file as everybody was hoping. 
But what is here, we're gonna come here to this folder for SPSS because we're using SPSS. And this is the heart of what we're going to be using. And it is this file right here, process.sps. The SPS extension means that it is an SPSS uh, syntax file. And so uh, you're gonna want to open SPSS and then open this. There is also a graphical user interface that is available here. It is up to you if you want to install it or not. Regardless of whether or not you install it, you absolutely must run this um, file every time you open SPSS and want to use the process macro. Now, the once you install the custom dialog, if you, if you do that, that will stay there, but it still doesn't work unless you have run this file uh, when you've opened SPSS. And this file looks like this, I've got it open. You can see here, this is process version four written by Andrew F. Hayes. Here's his personal website, here's process.org, all this. What you do, I do is just control A, and then go ahead and run the selection here to run this file so that it's active and ready in SPSS. When you've done that, you will see this in your output. And that means that the um, macro is ready for you to go ahead and use. So if you're going to follow along today, uh, please make sure that you have run that file so that when we run a process command, you will be able to um, get the output. I will explain the um, SPSS data set that we'll be using uh, a little bit later, but when you're looking for the point and click interface, if you have installed it, click on analyze, come down here to regression, and then come down here to process v4.0 by Andrew F. Hayes. And this is the dialog box uh, that you will see. I am not going to focus on using the point and click interface much at all during this workshop, and I have two good reasons for that. The first is that unlike most SPSS commands, when you use this point and click interface, it will not echo the syntax. So once you run it, you have no record of what you ran. Now, you do see the paste button here and you know everybody gets optimistic. Well, I'll just click on paste and that'll paste my code. And then you see the little warning down here that says, do not use paste. So um, there is no way to get the underlying syntax from this point and click um, interface. The other reason I would say I'm, I'm not eager to do this is because at least half of the options that um, Professor Hayes has incorporated into the process macro are not available through this point and click interface. So this is a very limited um, set of features and I would hate to kind of be that handicapped when using this. He's put a lot of time and effort into making this a very usable, fairly complete um, uh, macro. And to have so little of it available to you seems like a bit of a waste. So I'm not really gonna focus on this so much, but here it is. Um, like I said, we'll get back to the data set. Let's close some of these windows and go back to our web page here. All right, we're going to start off um, exactly where you would expect. We're going to start off with the simplest possible model, and then we're going to build ourselves up. I'm going to start with a simple mediation model. And as um, Professor Hayes uh, has in the title of his book, a regression-based approach, we too are going to follow the regression-based approach. Now, yes, it is helpful when you're thinking about the underlying math and the underlying um, uh, analysis technique here. But the reason I like to focus on it as kind of a regression thing is because most folks are very comfortable 
with linear regression. We're only going to focus on linear regression in this workshop. And most importantly, they're fairly familiar with interpreting the coefficients that you get in linear regression output. And those interpretations are going to be used uh, through most of um, the models that we're going to use today. And so that way, you know, you're, you're on familiar ground, you feel comfortable with that part of it, because like so much else in statistics, this mediation stuff is an extension of linear regression. There are just so many extensions to linear regression. So you've got to know linear regression very well. And this is just one of those oh so many different extensions. All right. So in a um, simple regression model, we have one predictor uh, X and one outcome Y. Uh, this predictor could be continuous, it could be binary, we're just going to keep it simple right now, so just the one and a one degree of freedom uh, predictor here. Now, this model seems to suggest that the some causality might go from X to Y, but in reality, we don't know that from just running a linear regression model. Instead, any relationship between these variables, whether it was correlational, causal, or something else, that would be determined by the way the data were collected or the nature of, of the data themselves. That part isn't captured in the model. So to get from this simple regression to the simple mediation, I scroll down here a little bit, we're going to add in this M, M for mediator. And it is typically shown to be kind of between our X and our Y here. And so when we start thinking about these relationships here, we can see that there's a couple ways to get from X to Y. We have this kind of direct route here. And then we have this kind of indirect route here going from X to M and then down to Y. And those are the things that we're going to focus on in this workshop. And that's um, what's going to uh, make this kind of a variation on your uh, typical uh, linear regression model here. All right, let's see here. What we're going to say here now is that since we've added this M in, as a statistical matter, we now have two regression models. We have one where X um, is the predictor and Y is the outcome. And then, um, I'm sorry, we have one where X is the predictor and M is the outcome. And we have a second one where Y is the outcome and X and M are predictors. So we've got these two equations here. We're gonna call this variable an antecedent variable because it precedes these two variables in the equation. Y here is gonna be called a consequence variable. It is seen as the consequence of X and or M. M here is both an antecedent and a consequent. It is an antecedent of Y because it's supposed to come before Y in our causal chain here. On the other hand, it is a um, consequent variable for X because it comes in here after X. And so although mathematically, all we've really done is added a second regression um, equation and put a, um, another predictor in it or a covariate, whatever you wanna call it, that's all the same thing. Substantively, we've really changed things. And this is gonna be where a lot of the um, interesting stuff happens. So now we're saying that we have this little tiny causal model. We are now necessarily saying that X is going to cause M, which causes Y, and we're going to say that X causes Y. And we've gotten into a causal framework. I'm going to put off the discussion of the causal framework stuff until the very end of the workshop. 
but it is critically important. And in your workflow, it is probably the issue that you will address long before you get around to using the process macro or any other sort of statistical analysis. You are going to have to address all of those issues, and there's a goodly number of them before you get around to doing any analysis, because otherwise you may not be justified in doing the analysis and interpreting the output. And so you certainly don't want to go to all of this work only to find out that there are, are problems in your output is not interpretable. So workflow wise, you would do that first. But since the point of this workshop is to show you how to use the process macro, I just put all that stuff uh, down at the end. Alrighty, so um, for this example, I'm going to assume that all three of our variables are uh, continuous. Let's see here. This is our outcome, our predictor, and our mediator. In the examples that I have coming up, I do sometimes switch between putting in variable names and calling them X, M, and Y. Uh, I actually prefer the X, M, Y thing because I think it's a little more generalizable, but for the point of the example, sometimes I did use uh, the variable names. So you'll see it either way on this page, it means the same thing, I just switch notation sometimes. All right, so we've got antecedents, we've got consequences. All right, so let's talk about the naming of our path. This is called the A path. This is called the B path. And this one from X to Y is called C prime. Not C, but C prime. So we've got A, whoops, we won't do that. A, B, and C prime. The um, total effect, now since, since we've got uh, these different ways of getting to Y, we have our direct and we have our indirect, our total effect is the sum of the direct and the indirect. Okay, that makes sense, right? And that total effect is what is called C. So if you were wondering where C is, C is the total effect, and this path here is our C prime. How do I get the indirect effect? Well, I simply multiply the path coefficient for A times the path coefficient for B. And that's how I get my indirect effect. Now that multiplication there has some implications for uh, how we're gonna do the analysis and is one of the reasons why people move over to use the process macro rather than running a series of regressions. And as you may know, if you've uh, studied some math or you just happen to know this, when you multiply um, numbers together, the um, sampling distribution for that tends to be not normal. And because of that, using normal theory when trying to calculate the standard error and hence the p-value, well, that gets to be problematic. Also, uh, simulation research has shown that that normal theory standard error and resulting test tends to be less powerful than other ways of calculating that standard error. And so the preferred method these days is to use something else. And Hayes has implemented a bootstrap in there so that you will get bootstrap standard errors, bootstrap confidence intervals for your indirect effects. And that's actually the default. Uh, there is an option to switch back to getting the normal, um, normal theory standard errors and confidence intervals. But in his book, he very much discourages that. And actually, I was actually kind of surprised that uh, he had it in there because in other uh, places where he says, you know, that doesn't make any sense or I disagree with that, he didn't even allow you to do it in the macro. So this is kind of one of the few places where he says, you really should not do this, but I'll let you do it if you really want to. So the default is to use bootstrap standard errors. His default is uh, 5,000 bootstraps, but that can be modified uh, depending on your needs and your preferences there. Um, and if you want, there is a way actually to get bootstrapped confidence intervals 
for all of the estimates. By default, you only get it for the indirect effects, but uh, if you want, you can get it for um, all of the um, all of the effects. Now, this is the diagram. I'll call these diagrams that you typically see, but it actually more correctly looks like this. And um, these are error terms. And there's one associated with each of these outcome variables. Now stop and think about what that means for a moment um, with respect to our regression and even with respect to this model. What does that mean? If anybody wants to unmute themselves and tell me what what is so important about the fact that there's an error term here, an error term here, but there is no error term associated with our predictor X. What does that mean? Why is that important? Anybody want to unmute and tell me? All right, well, I only hear silence. I'm hoping you're writing it in the chat, but like I said, I can't see the chat. So what this means is that your predictor variable is measured without error. And that is true. That assumption is true uh, both in linear regression and in these mediation analyses is that your predictor variables here or you know, your covariates or whatever you wanna call them, they're measured without error. Now, when you're doing an experiment, that's usually not a problem. You've randomly assigned your participants to one group or another, or one of your three groups, or however many groups that you have. And that's pretty safe to say you've measured that without error. In many other situations, that is perhaps not such a viable assumption. But just keep in mind that the way this model is defined, there's no error here. There cannot, or there's not supposed to be any error in the definition of your predictor variables. Alrighty, now the outcome and um, the mediator have to be uh, continuous. Now there is, I think there is one exception where Y can be binary. We're not gonna cover that but M definitely has to be continuous and process is actually gonna to check to make sure that this is true and it's not gonna run if it isn't true. So that is one of the things to keep in mind here is that we really are for the most part talking about a series of linear regressions because we're forcing our two outcome variables to be continuous. Um, X on the other hand can be continuous, it can be binary, or it can have multiple levels, you know, with A, B, C, D, or something like that, in which case um, process will create the dummies for you and then run it that way. We do have an example of that much later on in the workshop. So in this first example, though, like I said, everything's gonna be continuous. We're gonna try and keep it as simple as possible. And we're using this HSB mediation data set. This data set is completely fictional, okay? Totally, totally made up. Uh, the researchers randomly assigned participants to receive information about senior living facilities. And the amount of detail given to the participants ranged from just a little bit to quite a lot along some sort of continuous scale. This variable is called detail in the data set and it is our predictor or X. So you'll be seeing detail over here in this model. M is the age of the participant. So you'll be seeing age up here. And again, that is continuous. And Y is a measure of opinion strength regarding some proposed change in the law regarding senior living facilities, the data set will look like this. So uh, here is the uh, continuous detail variable. Here is um, age, which is our continuous um, mediator and opinion, which is our continuous um, outcome. I don't go into great depth in defining these variables or describing it much more because it's just 
a, a quick example that I made up. So, so don't get into the theory of this. I'm, I'm just trying to get examples to work here. If you want to run this as a regression in SPSS, there are, of course, um, I don't know, at least half a dozen different ways of running a regression in SPSS. And uh, the book, Hayes always uses the regression command. So that's what I did. And here's the syntax. You literally type regression. This is short for dependent. Um, that is age. So we are getting our A path here. We have our predictor detail and age is our outcome here. Method equals enter is just the way that SPS says, you know, run everything all at once. And then this is your predictor. Um, for this first output, I did a screen capture of everything that's in the output. But going forward, I won't include all of it because it just gets to be too long and we're not interested in most of it. What we're interested in down here is um, this uh, 0.552 and it's standard error of 0.053. So uh, let's see here, uh, that's this. Getting the B path over here, we run here with um, detail as, oh, I have a typo in my code. That's, whoops. Sorry about that. Uh, that should say opinion right there. I'm sorry. That should say opinion. And then um, detail and age are over there. OK, so since I think I screwed that up, let's skip past that. Here is what the process code is going to look like. Let's walk through all of this. We have process y equals opinion. So our output or outcome variable is opinion. Uh, the slashes for subcommands, often when you see SPSS syntax, the subcommands are on different lines. Uh, for space considerations, both Hayes and I put it all up on one line. If you're more comfortable with things being down on the different lines, then um, you know that's perfectly fine. It, do it doesn't make any difference. X is detail, M is age. So this is um, one sub command here. This is another sub command here. Now here is the magic happening here. And this is the model number. The model numbers you have to get from the book. And uh, Hayes is a very, very careful that nobody post what the models are with the model numbers because that's the way he gets you to buy his book. What the model number is, is really an alias for the various matrices that he's running behind the scenes to actually run the model. But I will tell you that um, this model here is so-called model four. This is model four. And we're going to be using model four or some variation on it for most of the workshop. So when I say model four, it really is this little triangle here. Okay, so scrolling down, scrolling down. So that's model four. And now I have a seed subcommand. And the reason we have this is remember what I said about the standard errors for the indirect effects being bootstrapped? Well, setting the seed there ensures that every time I run this code, I get the same standard error for my indirect effects. Now, if I hadn't put that there, it would vary a little bit from time to time because the bootstrap is a random process. But this here sets the seed or it sets the pseudo random number generator um, to a specific place so it reproduces the same results. Now, the advice in Hayes's book is to use the same seed for all of the analyses that are gonna go into a given paper or a given project or something like that. So you will see this seed here, which is uh, kind of the date, more or less the date uh, that I'm giving this workshop. Uh, you choose whatever you want. It doesn't, doesn't make any difference there, but that's why the seed is always uh, set like this. All right. Um, gone through all that. Here's um, a screen capture of what we did with in the um, point and click interface. And I'll bring that up in a second here. 
but I have put opinion here as my y variable, x is my detail, and age as my moderator. I have selected model four. This is critical. Do not forget to set it to model four because it defaults to model one. Uh, 5,000 is the default number of bootstraps. You can certainly change uh, that. So if I came here to SPSS and I came to analyze and my regression, and then I came down here to my point and click interface, what I did was I put opinion as my Y, I put age as my um, mediator, I put detail as X, and then I switched this down here to four, and now I'm good to go. What are these other things that we have here? Well, if you click on about, it just tells you uh, this information, which is what you would expect. For options here, this is what you've got, and we will actually go over some of these options uh, towards the end of the workshop. Some of these options don't apply to us, for example, here, because we don't have uh, interactions or anything like that. Uh, we will go over uh, getting robust standard errors later and changing the number of decimal places. Uh, this here is for um, interaction terms, which we're not covering, and the same with these things. So there's not a lot here that we're going to use for our, our current example. The multi-categorical, we will get here uh, a little bit later. And then, oh yes, <laughs> long variable names. Okay, so here's the trick with this. What Hayes really wants you to do is use variable names that are eight characters or less. And it has to do with the way that he wrote the macro. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But if you have variable names that are longer than eight characters, then you can click here or you can put that in here. And, you know, warning, warning, warning. And this could produce incorrect uh, output if the first eight characters are the same for the various variables. So, for example, you could have something called long variable name one and long variable name two and long variable name three. Well, you're going to have a problem with that because the first eight characters for those variables are all the same and the um, a macro could get confused. And so you have this checkbox. I accept the risk of incorrect output. So uh, I actually had to rename several of my variables, which is why some of mine look um, a little bit. This is binary VR instead of binary VAR because I, that was eight characters and that A made it the ninth character. I don't, okay, I got to shorten this up. And so I did my best to keep my variable names less than eight characters. This is something specific to his macro, not uh, to SPSS. All right, so that's what we've got here. And this is the output that you're gonna get. And I'll run this live in a moment, and then I'm gonna let you run it live as well. Yes, it is ASCII output. Okay, everybody stops and asks me the same question. What do you mean this is ASCII output, what? Andrew Hayes wrote this macro through the SPSS matrix procedure. And he did that as a courtesy to all SPSS users because SPSS is actually a series of modules. And most people don't realize that when they purchase it, and you, if you got, say, a super discounted price on SPSS, you may not have gotten many of the modules, including the regression module, which is exactly what he would want to use in order to run the analysis that are used in this macro. So instead of making any assumptions about the modules that any end user has, what he did was wrote the whole thing in SPSS matrix language which I can only imagine the kind of undertaking that was. I mean, full credit to him for, for doing that. And, um, you know, it was critical because uh, the matrix procedure, while it is very rarely used anymore in SPSS, is part of base SPSS. So anybody who has SPSS at all has 
the matrix language. And that way he could ensure that if you had a, a valid copy of SPSS, you could run his macro. And so that's why he did it through the matrix procedure. But since the matrix procedure is so rarely used anymore in SPSS, SPSS, the company, never updated the output. So it looks like the old MANOVA output, I think there's much else that they haven't updated, but yes, it really is the old ASCII output. It worked in my favor because I could easily come in and add in a few little things to help guide our discussion. And it made it easy for me to uh, bold some of the output to make it easier to draw your attention to it. All right, let's step through each of this uh, carefully here. We ran model four. We have um, opinion as Y, X as detail, and H as M. Please always look at this and make sure that you and uh, the macro had clear communication. Our sample size is 200. Like um, all of the other regression procedures here, um, it's going to do a listwise deletion on missing data. So if you have any missing data, your N is, of course, going to go down. And uh, to answer the obvious question that comes up from this, no, uh, you cannot use multiply imputed data with the process macro. Here's our custom seed. And here we go. So here's our outcome variable age. Uh, this part you can see that he captured it out of the standard regression output as well as capturing this part here. And here is that um, uh, we had set up above that it was 0.552. That's just rounded from this number here. And um, here is this number here. So this is directly what we got out of the regression. Here we have the outcome opinion. We had two predictors in that model. And so now we have um, this. Um, did I? Uh, we use the um, total option. Uh, no, we didn't use the total option. That'll come in the next one. We get the table of direct and indirect effects. Here's your direct effect and your indirect effect. And notice that we have the bootstrap confidence interval and excuse me, the bootstrap standard error and then the bootstrap lower confidence interval and upper um, confidence interval here. But these are the only ones that are bootstrapped here. And then you can see that we have a 95% CI and the number of bootstraps is 5,000. OK, so that is the basics of the output here. Um, the next part of this I go through and I just explain in words what I just explained uh, to you there. Um, you know, it shows here you can do the um, multiplication and get your indirect effects here. So the indirect effect is simply this. The um, uh, CIs are uh, bootstrapped. Because they're bootstrapped, uh, bear in mind that the point estimate isn't exactly in the center of the interval the way that it would be if it was based on normal theory. Uh, that's certainly OK. Um, another um, definition here. Uh, in a lot of places, I did include page numbers for the book if you want to go um, look at this. And I did quote some of this stuff from the book here. Um, if you had errors or anything went wrong, it would probably show up here in what I called part five of the output. And so I would not skip over that part, you know, just have a quick glance and make sure that nothing untoward uh, happened here. Um, now, what I did here is grabbed the um, coefficients and their standard errors from that output above, and I put them on my diagram. And this is something that is typically done when reporting the uh, results of these types of models. And so one of the things you need to get used to is looking at, um, you know, this and knowing that that's the A path, you know, and you 
come down here and you put it here and the 4115 is this this is the path between age and opinion okay this is the path between opinion and detail so i'm going to grab um, this number here and then process will give you the indirect effects and total effects uh, here um, so you don't have to calculate them yourself. And more importantly, you don't have to calculate the standard error. I mean, I understand everybody can multiply two numbers together uh, and do that, but it's really handy when it calculates the standard errors for you. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a moment for questions and to allow anybody to run this model uh, who would like to run this model. So uh, if you've got questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask me. Hi, uh, Christine. Uh, yes. I was wondering if we need to center our, uh, our variables. Uh, I remember that we needed to center some variables before we did the procedure. Would this be the case? And uh, no, you do not need to center anything. Um, centering was commonly done uh, when an interaction term was going to be included in the model. And we're not covering interactions today, but in general, uh, the need to center uh, isn't seen as important um, these days as it had been in the past. So the only time I would ever really center any of the variables would be if it was going to help in the interpretation in some way. And I don't see how it would help in interpretation in this type of model, but uh, my general advice with regard to centering or standardizing or anything like that is, well, when it helps in your interpretation, then by all means, go ahead and do it. But it is not something I think is ever mandatory or you really have to do you know there's no rule about that but i do remember back to a time when uh that was very common practice it's just not as common anymore thank you very much christine mm -hmm. any other questions please okay just so you know i really appreciate questions and i really like questions because it lets me know there's somebody out there um otherwise it's just me talking to my cat and honestly he doesn't really doesn't care what i say um so uh please ask questions if you want to run this model uh what i would simply do is copy and paste where to put the syntax i would simply copy and paste this into an SPSS syntax file and run it. You know, I, I'm not the world's best typist as you can see from my typos in here already. So I'm a big fan of simply copying and pasting. And in general, that's what we intend for this workshop and most of the pages on our website in general is copy our code, put in your variable names where appropriate and run it. That's, you know, that's what it's there for. Okay, that, that's why we write it like this, so you can copy and paste. All right, so we have gone through um, all of this, I believe. Um, let's see here, the interpretation of these coefficients exactly like um, regression, as we said. So uh, I don't wanna linger on this uh, too much longer here. Uh, get comfortable doing your path diagrams. I actually did it in um, PowerPoint. I didn't get everything quite aligned, but at least it was an easier way of doing it. Uh, the process macro will not make the path diagrams for you. It does do some graphing, but that is only related to uh, moderation analysis or uh, models that include interaction terms. And so, uh, if you want to use it as a way to graph interactions in SPSS, it's going to work well for that, but it will not create these uh, diagrams for you, which I, I actually think is unfortunate, but I know why you didn't do it. Okay, um, confirming the output here, I just uh, put in some math here. Uh, you can 
see that for yourself. But uh, the real reason you want to use process or any some program will do this. Um, you know, we've been talking about how you can do this through regression. You can also do this through uh, structural equation modeling software, whether you're an M plus user or if you want to use, say, Amos, which is um, another IBM SPSS product, if you want to use the sum command in Stata or um, what is it, Procalus in SAS, they're all um, SEM algorithms and will do this because you can think of this as a very, very, very simple structural equation model. And because of its relationship to the structural equation modeling world, that's where you start getting all the complications from um, uh, causality and stuff like that, because structural equation modeling is definitely all about causality. And since this is most of the way there, this is a structural equation model with all observed variables, that's where you get that whole causality thing. All right, let's go add some options here. And the way Hayes adds options is he adds optional uh, subcommands. And I have a partial list of the subcommands uh, down towards the end of it, but I'm going to introduce uh, two or three of the more important ones here. We add total uh, equal one means turn it on. By default, it's set to zero, which is turn it off. So equals one means turn it on. And it's going to add an additional part into our output, and it's going to add this part here. So this is the total effect model here. So you can think of this as a third um, regression model with opinion as the outcome in detail as the um, predictor here. And it will give you this part here. So you will get the total effect of X on Y. Here's your direct effect and your indirect effect. So I just bolded this new part here. Uh, that's an HTML error that I need to go fix. Um, so uh, because I particularly like getting especially this part of the output for all the rest of my examples, I do have that total equals one sub command. And that's just to add this into my output because when reporting things, uh, this is typically something that I would um, go ahead and report. The boot option. All righty, we're going to give you the boot. Uh, no, actually, what we're going to do is allow you to choose how many bootstrapped samples uh, that you go ahead and do. The default is 5,000. In this example, I set it up to 10,000. And then um, the output, all exactly the same. Until you get down to here, these numbers are a little bit different. And you can see that's because I'm doing 10,000 instead of 5,000. Honestly, for most purposes, 5,000 isn't isn't horrible and it certainly runs fast enough. If you're um, publishing or you know this is the final thing for your dissertation, you might want to kick it up to 10,000 or even higher. Um, it doesn't take that much longer, but while you're still working out the model and getting everything set up, I would certainly leave that uh, 5,000 as the default, make everything run faster. Um, as you would expect, adding more bootstrap samples is definitely an issue of diminish, diminishing returns. So, you know, going from 5,000 to 10,000 is one thing, but going from 90,000 to 100,000, uh, you're not going to see it any difference in this number of decimal places. All right, um, the stand option, that does not mean, uh, to, well, actually it might mean stand up and stretch, but no, uh, he calls it scaling of the results in the book. And what you probably know it as is getting standardized coefficients. So um, I added the stand equals one option. Again, that one means turn it on. I put it out here this time, just to show you that for the most part, it doesn't make any difference what order the subcommands come in. So uh, I put them in in the order that made sense to me, but um, you know whatever works for you, that's all good. So uh, 
what we're doing here is getting standardized uh, coefficients. Just the way SPSS regression does standardized coefficients, it's a mathematical transformation that's done after the regression has been run, as opposed to standardizing all the variables and then running the regression. So if you come down here, you will see here that you get some um, additional output put in here. Here is my standardized coefficient here. And again, standardized coefficients here and here. So, uh, and then here's your completely standardized, whoops, your completely standardized effects. What does he mean by completely? Does anybody want to take a guess? Talk to me. What does he mean by completely standardized indirect effect as opposed to what not? A completely standardized, partially standardized? I don't know. What does he mean there? Anybody want to take a guess? All right, <laughs> if nobody wants to take a guess, the answer's written right down here. Here, uh, Hayes makes a big to-do in his book that fully standardized results make sense only when all of the variables in the model are continuous. But as we said previously, X could be continuous, it could be binary, or it could be multi-categorical. And Hayes's point is that it doesn't make much sense to standardize a binary variable or a multi-categorical variable. And so when you have a model where all of your variables, especially X, is continuous, then you have completely standardized uh, indirect effects. We'll have an example later on when X is binary, and you will see that you get a partially um, standardized um, um, output there. So that's what he means by completely. It means that everything was standardized. All the coefficients were standardized because X is continuous. Um, and you'll see when we run it with a binary outcome that there's actually going to be a note put down here reminding you of, of that difference. OK, the decimals option. So the default up here, as you can uh, see here, is that you have uh, your output shown to four decimal places here. All right. If you want um, the macro to only show you two or show you, you know, I wouldn't increase it to like six because I, I never think that, you know, I think it's just false precision out at that level. But let's say that it would just make your life easier if it only, you know, had two decimal places and then you wouldn't have to do the rounding. You can use the decimals subcommand here. But this looks kind of weird unless you're used to formatting variables in SPSS, and this is the, it is a very old fashioned way of setting up formats for numeric variables. Uh, F is for float, and 10.2 means that you're going to have uh, two places for the decimal point. But you do have to use this notation here. If I wanted three decimal places, I would say F 10.2. Three. And then it ends in a period in the same way that SPSS syntax always ends in a period. It's like a sentence in English. You have to end it in a period. This is the end of the command. Um, and so that's what that final period is there. We see, you know, our standard output. We're all familiar with this. It doesn't change any. But notice now everywhere I have the decimals out to two places instead of four. A convenience command to be sure, but when you have um, lots of models or lots of numbers, it's kind of nice. You know, let the let the machine do the work for you. Okay, so we've gone through um, uh, this uh, simple triangle model with what I think is actually the simplest, easiest thing to understand. We've spent my gosh, an hour on it. Let's move on, shall we? We're going to return to our simple mediation model, but the 
uh, predictor now will be binary. Okay, so X is going to be binary. And uh, I called that detail two. And so the two just means that it has two categories there, right? And so again, we start off just running it as the regression. You do not need to do this. This is just to explain where those coefficients are going to come from. And you know that's what we're grabbing here. Uh, I got this one right. I put opinion here, detail two and age. Okay, and then we've got our two. Uh, the output looks a little bit weird, and it might look different on yours. The way my um, thing is set up, it gives the name of the variable and then the variable label. And so that's why this looks weird because the variable name is age and then it's age of participant. So if, if that looks kind of bizarre to you, that's why, but that's just the way mine is set. Okay, what does it look like for the process macro that what would you really type? You would say, well, Y equals opinion, X equals detail two, M equals age, model equals four. Like I said, we're gonna stick with our total uh, equals one optional subcommand and our seed optional subcommand. Okay, um, that doesn't look any different and it's not supposed to. Uh, process will detect that this is binary and that's okay. And then we come down here, that 10.5 should look familiar to you. Um, here, these things should look familiar to you, the, the six and the um, 0.0573. And then here we've got our total effect, our direct effect and our indirect effect with our bootstrapped confidence interval. So that's what we're looking at. And um, so uh, again, another quote from his book in this quote, special case where X is dichotomous with the two values of X differing by only a single unit. So X equals one and X equals zero. Y hat can be interpreted as a group mean, meaning that C prime estimates the difference between the two groups holding M constant. Okay, again, exactly what you would expect from a um, um, linear regression. You know, this is the difference in means holding um, the mediator or this other predictor constant, right? So like I said, that, that's why we were stressing this is because it makes the interpretation uh, a little more natural, a little more comfortable for folks. All right, uh, this is um, in ANCOVA uh, adjusted mean difference. Okay, sure. And so here are our coefficients and I just dropped them in on here. If we add the stand equals one optional subcommand, let's see what happens here. Okay, so we've got this, uh, we've added this. Uh, we know to expect these standardized coefficients at the bottom of each of the different groups of our, or different parts of our output. Okay, we're good there. Got this and now, Remember before it had said completely, now it says partially. So this is the partially standardized effects of X on Y. The partially standardized coefficients for um, the standardized coefficients for the dichotomous or multi-categorical X are partially standardized. So one very common question is to ask, well, when should I use standardized coefficients and when should I not? In general, what I think is that when you're in a metric that has its own inherent meaning, I probably would stay in that metric. So for example, one of the variables in our example is age, and we all understand what a one unit increase in age is. It's becoming another year older, another candle on the birthday cake. Okay, for things you know that are measured, um, of blood pressure or um, uh, you know anything like that, heart rate, uh, pounds, or what whatever it is those metrics have inherent meaning and I wouldn't want to move out of that 
um, metric because it actually means something. Now, if you think about my other variable, my predictor, which I call detail, uh, yes, it's ordered, but maybe it doesn't have so much of a meaning. Then for variables like that, maybe I'm starting to think, well, and maybe standardize it, um, especially things for Likert scales, because you know uh, they don't always, I mean, yes, we put in anchors and labels, but they don't have the same kind of inherent meaning that some of the other types of variables have. And so for the most part, I would say it's very much a judgment call. Um, what I have seen people moving away from is using um, standardized coefficients to talk about relative strength of the effect. And the reason they've started to move away from that is an acknowledgement that even though we're talking about a unit change in this, a standard deviation change here, the standard deviations are not equal. So even though I call it a standard deviation, sometimes I'm talking about a five unit change and sometimes I'm talking about a 10 unit change and those aren't actually equivalent. So I have seen some movement away from using um, standardized coefficients as kind of talking about a relative strength thing, especially when things are on very different metrics. Now, if it's uh, standardized and it's, you know, all kind of the same scale, that's, you know, that's okay. But, you know, when you have apples and oranges, th then maybe it's not as useful. Uh, in my own work, I almost never use um, any of the standardized um, coefficients, but there is a nice um, couple of um, write-ups in Hayes's book that talks about, he talks about in a couple of places. And um, like I said, though, he's very, very clear about not giving standardized coefficients for um, non-continuous predictors, and he won't allow you to do it in the macro. All righty, so if you can have two levels of X, well, why not have three levels, okay? Let's, let's step up our game here and uh, do that. Um, it, as in regression, it doesn't matter if that predictor variable is ordered or nominal, uh, just like it doesn't matter in regression, you still, in, uh, the regression command in SPSS, you have to provide the dummies, which is why I have, um, this is detail dummy one and detail dummy two. I actually had it written out as detail underscore dummy one and two until I like, wait a minute, way more than eight characters can have that. So that's why it got squished on down here so that I, I followed the eight character limit. But if I had used the GLM command in SPSS, then I would have just said, um, use the SPSS keyword with, uh, excuse me, by, whoops, sorry, use the SPSS keyword by, and then um, I could have just used um, the um, detail three and not had to dummy it out, but because I'm using the regression command, I, I dummied it here. Okay, that's why that's there in process. Um, MCX equals one. So this is multi-categorical X. So X has multiple categories. That's what the MCX is, multiple categorical X equals one. So turn it on saying that X has more than uh, two levels. And then you um, do this. The default here is dummy coding in the same way that the default in any other SPSS regression program would be uh, dummy coding. There are, uh, there's an option to use different kinds of coding. Uh, I'll show you what that is later on. Uh, but honestly, I don't know when I would really use those kinds of things. So uh, they, they exist. And we actually have a, a whole, whole chapter of our web book uh, about these uh, additional coding systems that you could use. The question, and uh, Hayes goes over this in the book, the question is, well, when would you use what? And 
the simple answer is that it always depends on how you wish to interpret your output, what comparisons you want in your output, um, that kind of thing there. But in reality, I have not, I honestly, I haven't, I don't even remember the last time someone used Helmert or orthogonal or sequential coding. Um, it certainly has not been within the last decade. I, I don't think it's even been within the last two decades that I've actually seen anybody use any of those. So they exist, they exist in SPSS, they exist in the macro, but uh, gosh, I just haven't seen, um, haven't really seen that. So uh, let's go. Oh, the other thing though, uh, let me get to the um, process output. This is interesting here. So uh, we put in dummy one, dummy two here, and then we get our coefficients here. We have um, opinion as the outcome. We enter uh, the two predictors and then our um, mediator here. We get our coefficients here. Um, and then this is the subcommand that we have added, multi-categorical x equals one. And so we've got detail three as our uh, predictor here. This three here just means that detail now has been broken out into um, three levels here. We use the same seed. And this is what Hayes is uh, using to tell you what is your reference group here. So my original variable detail three is coded zero, one, two. If we look at the... Um, excuse me, the uh, data set detail three here is um, zero, one, two. So zero, ones, twos, that's the way the variable is coded. And Hayes tells you here that he has two dummies, X1 and X2. Detail zero is the reference group, which is why when I did uh, this, um, it, dummy one is for category coded one and dummy two is for category coded two. So zero dummy zero is the reference so that it would match up. Um, that's, that's the way you did it, but that's the way you interpret this. When it's zero, zero here, that makes this the reference group. So this dummy is coded one when your original variable is coded one. And this dummy here, X2, is coded one when the original variable is coded two. Okay. Uh, and I, I purposely made it come out like that so it was a little bit less confusing. All right. So I put in parts again so that we could uh, walk through everything in the output. But again, uh, this, this here is interpreted as the effect of X1 compared to the zero group. So this is detail equals one compared to detail equals zero. This is detail equals two compared to detail equals zero. And again, this is our outcome variable age. So this is our A path here. All right, so this here, we're um, on the other side of the model, B path and C prime. We've got these, and again, um, interpreted with the reference group here. Um, here's our total effects, and here is this. So now, oh, look, we got a new word in here. We have relative total effects. Anybody want to um, unmute and tell me why they're relative total effects? It's a very quiet group. All right, they're relative because we have a multi-categorical predictor variable and these effects are relative to the reference group in the same way that the coefficients um, here are relative to the reference group. Likewise, if I changed my um, reference group, these numbers would change, but the omnibus test here 
uh, would not change, right? So the overall model wouldn't change. The omnibus, the two degree of freedom test, uh, I don't have it shown here, but if I did, uh, that wouldn't change as you change the reference group, but the coefficients themselves would. And that's why we start talking about relative direct effects and relative indirect effects because they are relative to the reference group and the particular values of those will change as the reference group changes. How do you pick the reference group? Typically, it is selected based on the comparisons that you want to have. So, you know, in this example, it's kind of high, medium, low, and I'm comparing to the uh, low detail group. If, you know, my research question was a little bit different and I wanted to compare to the high, um, excuse me, the um, high detail group, I simply would have recoded my variable and then used that as the, um, um, as the reference group. So again, the omnibus tests are not going to change the relative um, coefficients will. So there's a, a part of the book that talks about, well, what do I want to focus on? Do I want to focus on the relative effects or the omnibus test? And this question's a little more nuanced in path analysis than it is in regression. In regression, what we typically say is we'll go look at the omnibus test and tell me if the overall variable is statistically significant and if it is, then I have the privilege of interpreting my individual coefficients. Here in the path analysis, well, maybe I don't want to go that way with it. If the paths, say, have different signs or something like that, then maybe they're kind of canceling each other out. Or maybe I've got a measurement problem on one and not the other. So it's not quite as um, uh, straightforward or common as to which way to go. But all the same, I probably would stop and look at the omnibus test just to see what was going on. Because if the overall test isn't statistically significant, now I'm starting to wonder if I've got a good variable here in the model. All right. Um, has anybody run any of these models? Have you run, run these on your own installation of SPSS? Does anybody have any questions or comments about running these models uh, themselves? Okay. All right. Um, so we went over this one. This is using detail three as your predictor with the CMX equals one uh, subcommand there. So we went through all this output here. Um, I put it on this and honestly, you, you got to kind of make it large enough or space it out well enough so that it is clear which coefficients go with which lines. And you may or may not have liked the way I did this, uh, you know, set it up however you want to. But you can see here, and I put in x1, x2 to correspond to um, Hayes's output here. But you can see that if X had say four or five levels, well, this would get to be kind of a, um, a busy diagram here. So um, diagramming it is in many ways kind of its own little art form here to make it look, uh, look good, make it look readable because you're trying to convey information to folks. They, they want to look at something like this much more than, say, a table of results. OK, here is my whole write-up about um, relative effects. We've gone over this um, already, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. There are four 
uh, coding systems here that CMX equals one, the one is for dummy coding. If you had put CMX equals two, you would get sequential coding, CMX equals three equals Helmert, and CMX equals four is effect coding. Like I said, I have not seen these used in ages. Not to say that you should not use them, but they are not terribly common. And if you were gonna publish with some of these, you may have to uh, give a brief explanation of why you had chosen to move away from dummy um, to these other coding systems. But you know they're perfectly legit and they're out there. Um, of course, the p-values will probably change as the coding changes. And Hayes is careful to warn people not to go uh, fishing for statistically significant results by using um, different coding systems. Uh, I haven't seen that a lot, um, even in regression. So I wouldn't expect to see it a lot here in uh, this type of analysis as well. But uh, just be aware that you, you shouldn't be choosing the coding system based on p-values. Uh, some math here to uh, calculate the um, A path and the B path here. Um, I found with these when I did this that I had more rounding error than I had with um, some of the other um, models here. So the next question that you may ask is, well, what if I want to put in a covariate? Okay, that is very, very common to do. You certainly can do that. And your model would look like this. Now, I put in two for my example. Um, I think this is my binary and this one is my continuous. And I put in two only to show you that, yes, you could put in two uh, covariates, but also that they can be continuous or binary. There is no option for handling the multi-categorical. So if you had something that was, I don't know, your favorite flavor of ice cream, strawberry, vanilla, and chocolate, or something like that, you would have to dummy it out. And so you would have uh, dummies for the um, covariates like this. But this is what the model looks like. And you can imagine when you have to go put in the coefficients and their standard here, it's like, I'm running out of room here, you know. I'm wise, like, man, I'm under attack. Look at all those arrows pointing at me. All right, no, probably not. So you can add co uh, variates to any of the mediation models. They can be continuous or they can be binary. Um, one's continuous, one's binary in my example. Um, notice that both covariates are added to both equations, and that is really important. Uh, this is necessary for the direct effects and the indirect effects to sum to the total effect. But in general, it would be kind of an odd model, say, if these two lines didn't exist and the covariates were only included in this equation. There is a way to get process to run that model but you actually have to manipulate the underlying matrices yourself. There is no model number. There's no option that's going to um, uh, take the covariates out of one model and not the other. So, um, you know, I mean, I guess it's doable if you really needed to, but that would be a very, very specific, very unusual research question where you had the covariates in one model and not both. Typically, they're in both. And that's um, what is run in um, process. So we're familiar with y equals our outcome, x equals our predictor. I went back to the original continuous predictor just to um, make things easier here. Uh, here's age. Sticking with model four, we still have our total equals one. And here's the new um, subcommand. This is the COV for covariate. And I put in um, my binary covariate and my continuous covariate. And we left that seed option there. And then uh, here we see that we've added uh, the covariates right here. And then when you come down here, you see that they are in this equation here. 
and then again in this equation here because they, they go into to both equations. So we've got that. Here is our, um, our total effects and then um, they've done the math here for us. But again, notice that they are here. And um, like I said, uh, putting them all on the, um, on the lines got to be a little bit, um, a little bit more because, you know, you just kind of run out of, run out of space here. And personally, I always hate it when they make the numbers super small because my eyes are a little bit older and I, I don't see those small numbers so well anymore. So I always like to keep them really big. So if you're wondering why my, my images are big and my numbers are big, well, that's just me making life easier on myself because I, I don't see the small numbers so well anymore. Um, so that's what it is. Now, there is a question that uh, is on Hayes's fact page and it says, do you allow more than one um, predictor variable, more than one X? Well, as you can see here, um, I guess maybe it's not super obvious, but when you're looking here, you cannot put more than one variable on this X sub command. You can really only put one variable here. Um, we'll get to, um, in just a few moments, having multiple mediators, but you really only get one X. But what did I say about covariates way back in the beginning? Does anybody remember what I said about covariates? What did I call them? What's another name for a covariate? Does anybody want to unmute and, and answer that? What is another name for covariate in regression? Predictor. The answer is predictor. It's just another predictor. And so when you were looking at, uh, let's see, where did I, oh, maybe I didn't put in the um, regression models here, but it's just another predictor here. You can see here. And so when you ask, can you put in other predictors? Well, the answer is yes. And you put them here on the covariates. So that's the way that works. Um, nothing particularly magical about it. Um, but you know, if you don't, don't realize that relationship, the uh, process macro seems a little more limited than it really is. Okay, um, that was kind of fun. Uh, let's talk about uh, robust standard errors now for a moment. Um, SPSS added robust standard errors to some procedures. I want to say it was in version 25 or 26. Definitely by 26, they had um, uh, robust standard errors. We're currently on version 28. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, tried to keep SPSS current, why would I use robust standard errors? Anybody want to take a to guess? Anybody want to talk to me about why you would use robust standard errors? Okay, well, um, the answer is right here. Uh, they're often used when there's a question about meeting the assumption of homogeneity of variance. So if you feel that you have some minor violation of homogeneity of variance, using robust standard errors can kind of help protect you against that. When you violate homogeneity of variance, you tend to underestimate your standard errors. Remember that point estimate divided by standard error is test statistic. So the last thing you want is for that standard error to be too small because then your test statistic will be too large and then you end up with a bunch of false alarms, which you know nobody wants. So robust standard errors are a way of kind of inflating the 
uh, standard air so that it is more realistic. And I know a number of authors um, who regularly use robust standard airs, no matter what kind of regression they run, no matter what, that is just their default go-to um, is to always use robust standard errors. Uh, I'm not advocating that one way or the other. I'm just saying that um, you know it, they're commonly used here. And when SPSS implemented this, they implemented five different ways of calculating the robust standard errors. And I remember oh, a number of years ago, uh, the members of the group at that time had gone through these different definitions and run a bunch of examples. And what we realized was that no matter which option you used, your results were probably very similar. You know, you didn't get a lot of difference between these different options. Mathematically, they're all just slightly different. And um, we didn't have you know, particularly strong opinions about choosing one over another. Um, in this example, I use four. I think, I think that's kind of the default in SPSS. But like I said, there are others, and they are described a little bit later on here. You will see that this HC here is uh, for the robust standard errors. And I used four. I could have used any number from zero to four. I used four here. And then you will see here, I highlighted where um, you see the difference um, here. So these standard errors, if you compare it to the result um, previous, in general, they are um, larger than the standard. These are different, larger than the uh, previous results that don't have the um, robust standard errors, um, but it, it's just a mathematical calculation here. So uh, no really big, um, big thing. And then of course he puts a note um, here. Um, oh, I already told you the answer to this one, the multiple predictor variables and the, the little trick. Okay, so you've already had that one. All right, um, I'll tell you what, uh, we're a little more than halfway through, probably two thirds of the way through. Why don't we take um, a five minute break and we will come back and talk about models that have more than one mediator. Uh, and specifically, we're gonna talk about parallel mediation and then we're gonna talk about serial mediation. So two different kinds of models that have more than one um, mediator. And then we are going to go over um, a bunch of the subcommands that are available um, for you in process. And then we're going to wrap up with a discussion of the assumptions that you need to make when you're running these kinds of models. So why don't we come back at um, 37 minutes past the hour?
All right, before we resume, uh, does anybody have any questions? Any questions? Uh, guys, is there anything in the chat I should address? Um, I think I handled both. Okay. It's a very quiet group. All right, well, it's 37 minutes past the hour, so let's resume. Okay, we're gonna start off with parallel mediation, which is one of the uh, two kinds of mediation that would have multiple mediators. Um, and our example, we're gonna start off with, we're gonna have the uh, simplest case, and this is two mediators. So. Uh, your familiar triangle is right here. You have X, M, and Y, but now it's called M1 because now I have an M2. All right, so this means now, of course, that I have now two sets of indirect effects. The effect of X that goes through M1 and comes out at Y, and the effect of X that goes through M2 and comes out at Y. Now, in this path, you notice there are no arrows going between M1 and M2. Uh, you could have those if your theory uh, suggested that they should be there. But um, in this simple model, we have kind of as few paths as, as we can. So uh, this variable is gonna remain uh, age, the variable we've been using all the time. And this variable is going to be a new one that we haven't used yet called impact. Both of these are uh, continuous variables because the mediators in process have to be um, have to be continuous. We are going to continue to use model four, and that's critical. So you add now two variables on the M sub command, and it doesn't actually matter what order you add them in, right? So we've got this. Here are our various regressions. Uh, so we should have three of these. Here's this one and then uh, this one here. So uh, we've got all of that, but let's get to uh, the more interesting stuff, the process um, command here. We're familiar with process, y equals opinion, x equals detail. Here's the change. M equals both age and impact. I've left this total equals one just because I like the output that it includes um, for us. We are staying with model four. We're still in model four. And that is, um, like I said, super important. So here, um, M1 is the first uh, variable that you list on the M sub command and M2 is the second variable you list on the M sub command. If my memory serves, you can have up to six mediators. Uh, in truth, <laughs> I don't know any theory that, that would posit six mediators. And I can't even imagine the quality of the data set you would have to have in order to run such a model. All the same, uh, Hayes will allow up to six um, mediators if uh, that's what you really wanted. So here is our outcome variable age, and this is the path between detail and age. Here is our outcome impact and the path between detail and impact. Here is our outcome variable opinion, and now you see we have our predictor and both of our mediators included in this equation here. Okay, so again, exactly like you would expect it to be. Here's our total effects model, and then here's our total effect here, our direct effect here, and now we have two lines here for our indirect effects here, the indirect effect that goes through age and the indirect effect that goes through impact. Um, now, I actually <laughs> hijacked a, um, a commonly used data set on our website and renamed variables. So 
uh, some of my, my predictors aren't really great predictors for the purposes of this example. I'm just gonna let that go. But in the real world, if you saw output like this, you might want to um, consider whether this variable is really what should be there if it was measured appropriately, uh, but you might uh, not um, might want to look at anything that had output like this. All right, so we've got that and the interpretation is exactly the same, except for now you say holding both mediators constant when you're talking about uh, the direct effect or holding um, the other mediator constant when you're discussing um, the path to one or the other of the mediators. So again, your interpretation really isn't changing. You're just remembering to hold something else constant. Uh, looking at the second part of the output above, or second to last, we see that the total um, indirect effect here, whoops, in the wrong place, sorry. Uh, the um, total indirect effect here, um, as well as this and this. We're, we're given this, which is just these two numbers added together, right? Of course, you don't get the um, standard errors and the confidence intervals that easily, but it's pretty easy to see that this 0.2295 is the sum of the 0 0.2260 and this 0 0.0035. That, that's pretty obvious, right? Okay, so this is uh, what we've got going on for our diagram with um, this type of uh, parallel mediation. So parallel meaning that the mediation is happening at the same time um, this M1 and M2 are happening at the same time to have their influence out here on Y. All right, let's compare that to serial mediation where you have something that looks like this. All right, here we're saying that the effect of X comes up here to M1, comes over to M2 and then comes down to Y or it goes from X to M2 to Y. But importantly, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. That's kind of the flow of time as you're going across here. And so this is serial mediation because M1 has its impact on M2 and then has the impact down on Y. So you've got to be careful that this is preceding this um, in time. Okay, so um, that's what you have. Again, you're putting uh, both of the um, uh, mediators here on your M sub command, but what matters is that we have finally changed models and now we're in model six, all right? So all of this code would run exactly correctly if you had left this at four, except for you wouldn't be getting the model that you wanted. And so, uh, again, I don't know how, how you, you can't really use this without having the book so that you can get to Appendix A and see what the models look like. But this is model six here. Uh, we've added the uh, contrast um, subcommand here, and I'll show you that output in just a moment here. So. Again, this looks just like it did above, and there's nothing in here that tells you that we have moved from parallel to serial mediation, okay? And this output looks very much kind of like what we would have expected here, except for now we've got detail and age here. And then when we have opinion, now we have detail and age and impact so um, again, you really got to be careful um, that you specified the model you intended to. And then now the output looks really different. This is, this is where you will say, oh, this is really a very different model here. So now we have um, 
these here and these here, and these codes are all defined down here. So when you're looking at this, don't, don't stop and panic yet. Look down here. And so C1 is this independent one minus independent three, and um, C2 is one minus three, and C3 is two minus three. And this was the output of, from that contrast so that you could get all of that if you wanted to. And the indirect key here, so this end one, you're thinking to yourself, well, that was great. I know what C1 is now, but what is this? End one is the path that goes from detail to age and opinion. Independent two, this thing here is detail to impact to opinion. And um, this C3 talks about this and this end three is detail to age to impact to opinion. So that's where you're going to see the real difference there. And then I um, put in your coefficients like that. Alrighty. What kinds of questions do we have at this point? Because that was that was a lot. So what kinds of questions do we have, please? Okay, okay. Uh, I'm just gonna assume it was clear if nobody asked me any questions and I'm just gonna assume it was clear. All right, we're heading into the home stretch here. Let's talk about some of the subcommands that are available in process. And this is version four of the macro. And I tried to list only the subcommands that were relevant to mediation. This is not an exhaustive list of all of the subcommands that are available. But as we scroll through this, you will see that there is so much more in um, this list and you know, even more than what's here in all the process than what is implemented in the point and click interface. And that's why I was saying, well, you know, you've got to have a written record of the analysis you've run. And that is so limited that I probably wouldn't recommend using it, you know, much more than just to get yourself started. And instead I would, um, use use the syntax and take full advantage of all of the nice features that Hayes has put into this macro. So we're familiar with these first ones here. So we have um, y as our outcome variable. It must be either continuous or binary. I didn't put in any examples of using it as binary, but it will do a binary logistic regression for you um, if y is binary. X is the predictor variable. It may be continuous, binary, or multi-categorical as we have seen. And M are the mediators, one or more, but those must be continuous. There's no, uh, no uh, um, changing that. If you put in a different kind of mediator, say it was a count variable, it's still gonna be estimated with linear regression. And that um, may possibly be problematic. So, um, just keep in mind that that's what's really happening um, here is that he is running linear regression. Uh, although we did not cover um, moderated um, analyses in any way, W and Z are the um, subcommands for moderators. And so instead of putting multiple moderators on the same subcommand the way you do with mediators, they are broken out like that. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that flows from that. But um, when you look online, you do see a lot of W's and Z's. And I just wanted you to be aware that those are moderators. And that's not something we covered in this workshop. So the model, the model specifies the number. And those numbers are found in Appendix A of uh, his book. Um, be careful. I think that some model numbers did change between editions of the book. And so uh, I forget, 
I think it was version one and version two went with the first edition of the book. Version three went with the second edition of the book and version four of the macro goes with the third edition of the book. But, and then he eliminated some model numbers from this last one, if I remember correctly. But anyhow, you do want to try and keep the edition of the book consistent with the version of the macro you're using so that, again, there's clear communication between you and uh, the process macro. The seed, we use the seed subcommand and it allows the user to set the seed of the analysis will uh, replicate exactly. Here's an interesting little thing for you. So um, I said that when um, uh, he started this, he wrote the macro for SAS and SPSS. And it turns out that they use a very similar or maybe even the same random number generator. So if you use a seed a specific seed say in SPSS with the process macro and for some reason you had SAS and you had installed the process macro in SAS, if you use the same seed, you would also get exactly the same answer because it's using very similar or the same random number generator. That is not true in R. So if you use the same seed in R, R uses something completely different and your results will vary slightly, uh, but they will match exactly between SPSS and SAS. Just thought that was interesting. Uh, stand, stand equals one. Um, this gives standardized uh, coefficients or partially standardized coefficients if X is binary. Um, conf, we didn't use this one, but it allows uh, the user to set the confidence interval. The default is 95% CIs, but if you wanted 90% or 99%, you could use uh, this. Um, uh, optional subcommand uh, to vary that. COV is for covariates to be included in all models, and those covariates may be continuous or binary here. Boot, we used a boot, and that allows the user to set the number of bootstrap samples for the um, uh, confidence intervals and standard errors. The default is 5,000. Now, this model BT. And if you said it's a model BT equals one is what you'd write in the code. This requests that the bootstrap standard errors and confidence intervals are used for all models. So uh, for all estimates. So, you know, if you wanted everything to be bootstrapped and I have um, worked with a number of clients who have preferred that, then you have this option and it's certainly easy enough to suddenly get bootstrapped estimates for all of the values in your um, mediation model, and that's super cool. Okay, this HC part, um, the HC part here, this is your uh, robust uh, standard errors. Here is your zero, your one, two, three, and four. Uh, guys, I literally, literally copy and pasted this from page 582 of the SPSS command syntax reference. Uh, that's the only place I found that information. But the reason it matches up like that is because that's exactly what Hayes took it from. Um, it is literally, literally this. Um, whether that is, you know, um, helpful or not to you is uh, a completely different story, but that's um, where I got that information from. So it's straight out of the reference manual. Decimals. We, um, did use the decimals optional subcommand to control the um, number of decimal places. The default is to show four decimal places, but you can reset that to whatever your preference is. Again, we did uh, we did use the CMX. This indicates that X is multi-categorical. The one means that you have dummy coding. Um, that's an interesting typo. I should fix that. Um, two is sequential coding, three is Helmer, and four is effect. This is for the multi-categorical W and Z. These are the moderators here. Um, I copied and pasted. Hmm, I can see that. All right, I'll go fix that. Um, anyhow, so you can have the multi-categorical um, moderators if you're going to do this. Long name here, um, you would use long name equals one on the, um, in your syntax, 
but be very, very careful using that. I would strongly recommend that you have only um, eight characters for your variable names, just to make sure that your output is accurate. Um, you know, there's no point in going to all this time and effort to run these kinds of models and interpret them only to have something um, go wrong simply because of the way you named your variables. So I'd, I'd be careful there. Um, effect size um, was replaced with this stand uh, thing in version four of the macro. So this is a deprecated thing that you may actually see the um, uh, option used somewhere online. So this has been taken, it, it still runs, but it gives you the same thing as using stand equals one. Uh, total adds the total effect to the output. We saw that uh, normal calculates standard errors using normal theory, uh, normal theory, but this is definitely not recommended. Um, contrast, uh, contrast equals one is a test for the difference between um, uh, the regression coefficients. Uh, equals two is a test for the difference between the absolute values of their weights. And that may be useful if you want to compare one positive indirect effect to a negative indirect effect in order to assess whether uh, the positive one is significantly larger than the negative one. So you've got two options there. One is just a test between the different regression coefficients. And when you use equals two, it's a test between the absolute values. Again, this is a little bit different than you'd see in regression because now the path coefficients, the sign, um, you know, when you um, put them together, they might start to cancel one another out and uh, you wouldn't want to miss an effect just because the signs were like that. All right. Here are the last ones. We don't show examples of it because I thought it might be a little too much for this workshop. But what you can do is use um, the matrices subcommand, so matrices equals one, to show what the B matrix is. And then you can use these other subcommands here to um, actually modify the model that is being run. Now you still have to give a model number. Okay, there is no going around giving a model number. But if you're going through Appendix A in the book and you say, well, goodness, I don't see exactly the model that I want to run. I, I need to modify something. Hayes does give you a way of modifying the model with these. Um, but it is not the most straightforward thing that you've ever uh, seen before. So that's kind of my list of the various subcommands that, um, that are useful when you're running a mediation analysis. What kinds of questions do folks have uh, regarding this? Uh, I have a question, Christine, can you hear yes. me? Yes. Um, can you just uh, explain the contrast uh, function again, uh, specifically in relation to the last uh, kind of model? Because in that last model, contrast shows up in your uh, syntax. Yeah. OK. Uh, let me pop over here. Ah, OK. So I did. Uh, do that. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. This is in the parallel mediation. So let's go ahead and run that in the parallel mediation. Let's see, where's my output? Okay. So you always look down here and see that it's running matrix because, like I said, he, he ran everything through the matrix uh, command, right? Um, yeah. But if you were hoping for Keanu Reeves to show up, Sorry, not going to happen. Um, I would have liked that, but not going to happen here. So uh, your output here for this, and this is when I had contrast set to one, we see um, uh, this. OK, now when we come down to this, it should 
let's see here, scroll, scroll, scroll. Um, yes, so here there are differences between the absolute values of the indirect effects. Now, did I have, okay, so it's difficult to see in my example here because my indirect effects are all positive. But if this had slipped over into being negative, this is still going to give me the difference between this positive and what would be a negative coefficient, as opposed to down here. Is that, is that down there? Um, down here, what it's going to do is set both of these to absolute values and then do the difference. And so you would get something a little bit different. And the reason that's important, let's take an extreme example. Let us say that these numbers were, were nearly equal. Let's say that um, this 0 0.2260 and this um, 0 0.0035, let's say that they were somehow uh, nearly equal. If one was positive and the other was negative, when you look at the uh, total indirect effects, you could be looking at something very close to zero. And you might be thinking, gosh, there's really nothing there by way of indirect effects, when in fact there really is something there. It's just that when you sum them, you have, or difference them, you've, you've wiped them out, right? They've, they've kind of canceled each other out. And so you can use contrast equals two so that when it does that test, it works on the absolute values, basically getting rid of the negative, so that when you get that total, then it, it looks like something other than zero. Does that make sense? Um, yes. Good, good. I'm, I love it when it makes sense. Okay. Um, let's see, is there anything else interesting? Um, yes. So if I run this, let's go ahead and rock this. Um, still running, still running. Gotta look down at the bottom. Still running it. Um, I added that um, matrices equals one optional subcommand. That's what I added it here, right? What that includes in your output now is this. So the from variables are uh, the columns and the two variables are the rows, right? So you can imagine kind of what the path looks like. And these are the freely estimated, and we don't have any zeros in here, but they would be fixed to zero. And what Hayes lets you do is get in there and muck with that a little bit so that you can add or delete paths. Now, in our simple triangle, there really isn't much <laughs> you can add or delete, right? You got to leave that alone. But when you get into the, excuse me, into the much more complicated models where you have either parallel or serial um, mediation, you may wish to add or delete paths. And that would not correspond exactly to one of the models listed in Appendix A, but you could add or delete the path as needed. And so it, this is its way of trying to tell you what is there, and then you can go mess with that. Um, on your own. But again, uh, I would be very, very careful that there was clear communication between you and the software, because uh, since a uh, process isn't going to make the path diagram for you, you've got to be very comfortable putting those coefficients on the paths and knowing that you know, you've got the right number of coefficients for the paths you know, at a minimum. Okay, um, the very last thing we're going to talk about here is um, criteria for making causal claims. And this is non trivial. And in a way, I feel very bad that it is this kind of small paragraph in this otherwise fairly long workshop because 
uh, books get written on this and tons of articles get written on this. And this is one of the areas in statistics where you need to realize that the reporting standards have changed greatly in the last, call it five to 10 years. Long gone are the days of Barron and Kenny and the causal steps approach. I'm almost positive you can't get any of that kind of stuff published today. And I very carefully avoided any and all mention of those terms in the Barron and Kenny method because, uh, you know, it, it really has been, um, I want to say discredited, but we've really moved beyond that. Hayes has several sections where he goes into great detail explaining why this method, which was very widely used for some 20 years, is now no longer acceptable. And um, I'm not going to recap all of that, but I just want to say that um, especially if you're working with an older advisor or you have been publishing for a long time and you know you have done this for ages, it really is a completely different game now. And so you know just please expect that when writing. A lot of the work by Judea Pearl, who's at UCLA and uh, Tyler Vanderweel, who is at Harvard, have been very influential in this change. They're not the only ones but uh, they have been uh, very, very influential. Um, if you have a choice, read Tyler's work <laughs> instead. Um, I, I cannot get through um, even some of the easier stuff by Judea Pearl. Uh, that is, man, that is some really thick, dense, um, very well written, but very, uh, that, that's a tough, tough one. So uh, Tyler Vanderweel kind of unpacks it and puts it into language that I feel most people can understand. Um, a complete discussion of what is currently, and I stress currently because this field is still changing. So the current set of criteria is well beyond the scope of what I intended to cover in this workshop. Um, Oh, oh, you know, I forgot to give you my good joke. So my joke here was that, because you know, every stats workshop has to have a good joke, right? So remember at the end of the uh, Doctor Strange movie, it's been, it's been on TV, if, if you've been watching TV, watching reruns and stuff, um, there's been on and towards the end, he says to the bad guy, gosh, you know, you really should have stolen the whole book because the warnings, the warnings come after the spell. And so in my workshop, I think of the syntax for the process macros, kind of the spell. It is the magic that gets you the output you want. But I think of these as all of the warnings or all of the caveats that could threaten the interpretability of that output that I got. And so just because I got the model to run without errors, you know, which is a necessary component, but it is not sufficient. And so I've got to worry about all of these other things here. And like I said in the beginning, in my workflow, um, this is something I would have dealt with before ever getting around to writing code. So um, these simple models, these simple path models here with all observed variables are still considered to be causal claims. They're considered to make causal claims. And that's one of the big jumps from regression to mediation is that you have now kind of stepped into the word world of causality. And there's a bunch of things that you need to consider when trying to make causal claims. 90, 95% of those things cannot be assessed with your data set. And that is another thing that spins people around is that they are used to having all the information they need in their data set. And this is information that is not in the data set. It is something around the data set. And so you need to be very careful here. Okay, first and perhaps the most obvious is that the predictor must precede the mediator, which must uh, precede the outcome in time. In other words, your antecedents have to be before your consequences. 
um, in other words, cause must come before effect. However you want to say it, you've got to have your temporal ordering correct. What that means functionally is that almost always cross-sectional data sets aren't helpful for these kinds of models because those data sets collected your predictor, your mediator, and your outcome all at the same time. And even if you tried to say, you know, looking back 10 years ago, you know, this is my predictor, looking back five years ago, this is my mediator, looking right now, you know, that's my outcome. Still, it is difficult to argue that you've got kind of a causal chain of events there. And so um, you need to have a data set collected in a certain way to even consider running these types of models. Um, second, uh, just because you selected a particular variable to be your mediator doesn't mean that that's the only mediator, mediator out there. And it may be the only variable in your data set, but maybe there was something that you didn't collect. Maybe some other researcher went out and collected the same predictor and the same outcome, but a different mediator. And there's really no way to argue from whatever's within your data set that you have the right mediator. And Hayes goes through uh, some examples of this, um, but again, it's a logical argument. It could be, you might've gotten the real mediator, but you could have used something that's just correlated with the real mediator, or perhaps uh, there's a variable that's not in your model, not even in the data set, that causes both the mediator and the outcome. And so you, you start getting into this kind of logical quagmire. Um, when thinking about experiments and causality, most researchers immediately think of randomly assigning subjects to their experimental groups or to their conditions. Great, wonderful, definitely want to do that. But that assignment doesn't mean that the mediator causes the outcome. And when you look at the path diagram, you kind of see why they're saying that, you know, I assigned people to X that doesn't say anything about the B path that goes from M to Y. And so, you know, um, again, this is a whole logic thing. Um, Tyler Vanderwill has a 2015 paper, uh, Mediation Analysis, A Practitioner's Guide, and he talks about at least four things that have to be true. No confounding between X and Y, between M and Y, between X and M, no confounding between M and Y that is itself affected by X. Again, you can see that these are assumptions that you have to address in your write-up of this, whether you're writing a dissertation, a paper for publication, whatever it may be. But the information about not having confounders between these variables that is not information that is contained in your data set. And so there is a whole lot more that you have to write about above and beyond the results that Hayes has in the output for process. Um, and it's, it's definitely not easy. It's a much higher bar to reach than it had been under the old Baron and Kenny model there. Um, Let's see here. I don't put anything in here about write-up or what you should include in a write-up because like I said, that's changing fairly quickly. And by the time I put it in here, it's going to be out of date. So uh, definitely check the uh, journal you want to publish in for very recent articles that use these kinds of models to see what the current standard is. Now, I do have one other thing. I Got yes, here we are. So uh, I'm an Amer I'm a member of the American Statistical Association, and one of the sections from ASA sent out uh, this email here uh, for the Society for Causal Inference um, instead of uh, CSI. This is SCI, and this is the Society for Causal Inference. They've got three objectives here. And this is something that you could 
actually join if this whole causal inference thing is something that appeals to you that you want to really get into. If um, you want further information on this, uh, boy, there's, there's a bunch of classes, there's a bunch of information. It is definitely, definitely a hot topic in statistics here. And um, so there's a lot, lot going on. Alrighty, um, I am pretty sure that Andy and or Siavasha put in the chat the uh, little questionnaire thing about um, this workshop. That's uh, a general page and you have to scroll down to um, comment on this particular workshop. So please make sure you actually comment on this workshop and not somebody else's because you know, one of my coworkers to come to me as a Christine, I got this really weird comment. I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's okay. Um, so that kind of wraps up what I have for today. Um, included in the data set that I um, linked here, I put in other variables so that you could try the code that's on the web page and then change out the variables if you wanted to try um, try something else just to to see how it works and such. But um, that is that is pretty much all that I have. Does anybody have any questions? I'm going to stop the share here. Does anybody have any? questions that you would like to ask? Oh, moderated mediation. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, again, uh, that's going to be a long involvement. You know, I struggle with doing that because it necessarily makes it a two part workshop. And the problem we have always had with two part workshops is that people will come to part two without having gone to part one. And then they're totally lost and frustrated and upset. And it's a very negative experience. Um, but as long as you have attended this and you're able to, um, you know, able to add that moderation part onto it, um, you know, great. Yes, absolutely. The other thing that I um, definitely want to, um, uh, write a page on, and I don't know if it's really worth the whole workshop, but um, this macro can be used for graphing interactions in SPSS, which has always been a weakness of SPSS, you know, graphing an interaction, even in a linear model, unless it's categorical by categorical, man, you're out of luck. And so this uh, process macro can be used for doing that kind of graphing. And, um, you know, it definitely seems like more work than it would be in other statistical software packages, but at least it would be doable. So I might consider doing something, you know, just to help you visualize the interaction, because for most folks, that's really what you need. You know, a single regression coefficient really is difficult to convey the whole meaning of an interaction. And so, um, um, Having, having that ability in SPSS, I think, would be helpful. OK, uh, questions? Anything else? Um, in the new future, will you have the same workshop for Stata users? Actually, <laughs> I was thinking that would probably be the first place that I flipped this would be into uh, Stata. So uh, hopefully, yes, the answer will be yes, that I, I am going to move this into Stata and probably also into M+. And the reason I would move them into both Stata and M+, is in both of those, um, you know, you're, you're pretty much in a SEM framework. And 
this is kind of your introduction to uh, those kinds of models. And so for those of you who are new to this, it is a good way to, you know, get your foundation, get, you know, get yourself comfortable with these simple models, and then you can definitely extend uh, and do far more complicated models in those software packages. So um, moving this into, um, um, moving it into Stata and M plus would definitely be um, something that I will be looking into sooner rather than later. Will we have a workshop on SEM? Um, possibly, I don't know what software package we would be in. Um, but yes, uh, is R an option? Probably, yes, it is. Um, if you get the third edition of the book, all the um, code is written for the SPSS macro, the SAS macro, and then the um, R macro as well. But the truth is, in R, you have other packages that may actually do more or be easier to use than process. And so I'm not quite sure where process fits into um, fits into kind of that um, uh, landscape of available packages in R. Amos, I don't know about Amos. Uh, when we write these workshops, we try to keep an eye on what researchers at UCLA or at least at the University of California are doing. And although we do have an Amos license, I have not seen much use of Amos. So yes, it could certainly be done there, but I just haven't seen a lot of people using it, um, uh, to be honest. What other questions, please? All right, well, if no one has any further questions, we're going to call it a day. I will stick around for a couple minutes if anybody wants to ask a question and not have everybody else here. I'll, I'll hang around for a couple more minutes. But thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, I hope that uh, you got something good out of this workshop. Uh, we will be trying to post it uh, sooner rather than later. but. If that really does take time because we've got to edit the video and make sure that all the um, captioning and stuff is correct. And uh, that just, just takes a little bit while, but we will try to get it posted as soon as we can. Thank you. All right, Andy, do you want to stop the recording?